Hey guys, I'm Mike, and I don't know about you guys, but I'm actually kind of excited that we're getting yet another Spider-Man reboot. I can't wait to see what director John Watts brings to the franchise. His last film, Cop Car, was awesome. Hey for the best! And it was an amazing mix between Spielberg and the Coen brothers, so I can't wait to see how he tackles Homecoming. I love seeing different interpretations of Spidey's stories, and it's even cooler to think about what could have been. Like, did you know in 1991, James Cameron almost made a Spider-Man movie? It was never produced due to legal problems, and that's kind of a shame. His leaked script has gotten a bad rep among Spidey fans, and don't get me wrong, it is definitely weird. It's not the most faithful adaptation, but that doesn't mean it would have sucked. Using Cameron's treatment and these awesome storyboards courtesy of one very talented Italian Spidey fan, we're gonna walk you through the Spider-Man movie you've never seen and show you how James Cameron's Spider-Man could have been great. But first we have to talk about the 90s superhero style. Tim Burton's 1989 Batman movie set a new standard for comic book adaptations. It was dark, it was gritty, it was stylized, and it was a $400 million genre-defining success. After Batman, people just assumed that's what superhero movies had to be like. Cameron's Spider-Man is very much in that mold. It's pretty violent, and it's definitely R-rated. It's also a lot less faithful to the comics than the movies we're used to today. I know, Spidey has always been a more lighthearted character. What's up guys? Wait a minute. You guys aren't the real Avengers. I can tell Hulk gives it away. I too like my web slinger kicking butt and cracking jokes. That's a cute outfit. Did your husband give it to you? But the darker tone was what people were looking for in 1991, and it allowed Cameron to write a Spidey story with way more complex themes. Cameron's origin story is more or less the same, so like Marvel Studios, we'll spare you the details this time. With great power comes great responsibility. But some of the beats are distinctly different. Tragically, there's no pro wrestling match with Macho Man Randy Savage. No awesome Uso is Randy. Oh man, that's so good. I love him. I love him. Best cameo in the movie. Instead, Peter Parker starts his Spider-Man career as a street performer who works his way up to private parties and even public access television. But that's a pretty minor change, especially compared to the controversial organic webbing. Instead of having fun swinging across rooftops and blasting Dr. Pepper cans, Cameron's Peter is horrified by the web shooters that are like literally growing out of his wrists. He thinks he's a monster and starts dressing in long sleeve shirts to hide the gross new body parts. Peter even makes fake web shooters out of an old watch band. He's humiliated by his mutation and wants people to think he's invented his webs. This almost made it into the 2002 film, but it didn't quite make the final cut. Peter is afraid of his changing body. He's afraid the world will see him as a freak of nature. It's heavy stuff about embracing the newfound powers and responsibilities of adulthood. It's a theme at the core of nearly every version of Spider-Man, but it's rarely brought forward this bluntly. Like when Peter, like this is the craziest part of the script because like Peter discovers his web shooters after, you know, basically having a wet dream. Actually, scratch that. That's the second craziest thing. There's a bondage sex scene in this movie. Peter starts researching spiders once he gets his powers and he learns about a species that ritually webs up its mates. So when Spidey and MJ hook up on the Brooklyn Bridge, he ties her down with a little before, you know, doing the deed. It feels weird to see high school Peter Parker getting it on, but at first love is as much a part of adolescence as acne. Teenagers, raging hormones, they never change. But Cameron had the perfect pick in mind for his Peter Parker. Cameron's first choice for the role was Leonardo DiCaprio, just when he was taking off as a sitcom star in Growing Pains. But if he didn't work out, Cameron's second choice might have been even better. But before we get there, let's talk about Peter. In the script, Peter is from Maryland, which makes him even more of an outsider. Maryland? What's there? I mean, I know. Who would want to be an Orioles fan when you can be a Mets fan? By the way, this is the only time Peter Parker has ever been born somewhere other than New York City. Cameron describes Peter as awesomely shy and desperately lonely, which is pretty standard for the character. Hi, MJ. We could get together hey, sometime. But this Peter is angry and defiant. He wears his outcast status like a badge of honor, and he's really, really resentful of the rich kids he's stuck in school with, even Mary Jane. No. Jesus, Parker, you are a freak. But Cameron also emphasizes that he's a plucky kid who's got true grit. As amazing as Leo is, there was only one kid in 1991 who could have pulled off a character this complicated. John! 
Edward Furlong was Cameron's second choice for Peter Parker, and frankly, it's pretty inspired. Furlong is intense, he's authentic, he's got a potty mouth. F you, you little dipshit. Did you call moi a dipshit? And let's face it, John Connor and Peter Parker really aren't that different. They're both angry young men saddled with unwanted responsibility. This is my gift, my curse. Who am I? I'm Spider-Man. Shack up with anybody she can learn from so she can teach me how to be this great military leader. I'm saying, sorry kid, your mom's a psycho, didn't you know? I hated her for that. But everything she said was true. It's more than any kid their age should have to deal with. Cameron even got an incredible performance out of Furlong in T2. Shit, don't forget about Pepper. Oh shit, I forgot about Pecker. Yeah, he plays like a photographer in that. God, it's a Pecker moment. Can't you see that kid is just an amazing Spider-Man? So now that we know more about this version of Peter, let's bring on the bad guys. Lance Hendrickson was going to play the main villain, Carlton Strand. He's the android in Aliens, when he's just doing the <laughs> That guy is like the perfect shrewd criminal. Thank you. <laughs> he's kind of a mix between Electro and the Kingpin. Strand was a small time crook who gets electric powers after an accident and uses them to become a billionaire. So why didn't Cameron just call him Max Dillon or Wilson Fisk? Well, he's not really either character. Sure, he's got Electro's powers, but in the comics, Max Dillon is a clueless thug, not a shrewd businessman. He's no Gordon Gecko. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Electro is the kind of guy who would use his godlike power to rob a Dairy Queen, not Strand. He uses his electric powers to tap into phones and manipulate networks in order to steal a fortune without lifting a finger. I'll give it to him, that's pretty damn clever. But Strand ain't no kingpin either. Wilson Fisk doesn't need special powers to run an empire. He sees metahumans as a useful tool to be exploited, not members of some new master race. Carlton Strand has elements of both characters, but he's unique enough to justify the new name. Strand also has a henchman named Boyd. Cameron really wanted Michael Bane for the part, and he's basically the Sandman, just with a different name. What's, what's different about him? Nothing, there's nothing really different about him. Boyd is like just the Sandman. But that Sandman is basically the T-1000. Cameron was clearly in love with CGI shapeshifting in the late 80s and early 90s. He used it in both The Abyss and T2. And in his Spider-Man treatment, the Sandman is morphing and dissolving all the time. It's optimistic for 1991 special effects technology, but I'm sure Cameron would have figured out a cool way to make it work. Of course he would have. He's James Cameron, before Avatar, before Titanic, James Cameron was at the height of his game in 1991. I'm the king of the world! <laughs> Dropping blockbuster after blockbuster after blockbuster. He's like a 90s Christopher Nolan, a master of kick-ass action flicks that also managed just to be amazing movies in their own right. When studios let an artist like him go wild with a character, they usually deliver. Cameron's 47-page script is a fascinating glimpse into the creative process of one of cinema's greatest storytellers at his peak. With a lot of work, his rough draft could have kicked off a maybe great, definitely profitable Spider-Man franchise in the early 90s. Like Cameron himself even said, if Fox just spent a couple extra hundred thousand dollars they would have had a two billion dollar franchise he was that confident in that movie it's nuts sure there's a lot to fix and flesh out but the bones of a really cool movie are in there sam raimi's spider-man was the right movie for its more optimistic time and Homecoming fits right into today's cinematic universe. But in the same way, Cameron's script was perfect for the cynicism of the early 90s. Viewing it through today's superhero lens doesn't quite do it justice. Yes, it's not as faithful to the comics, and yes, there are plenty of uncomfortable and odd moments. But look, James Cameron's Spider-Man would have been a strange movie. No one's arguing that. But that doesn't mean it would have been a bad one. If superhero films have taught us anything, it's that being weird doesn't stop you from being awesome. Hey guys, I'm Mike. Thank you guys so much for watching. I want to give a huge shout out to Daniele Tomasi for his awesome storyboards. This video would not have been possible without them and he actually published an ebook with Cameron's original script and his storyboards. I highly recommend it. It's a great read. And for more deep dives like this, please subscribe to Now This Nerd. Thanks.